And the next item of business is a debate on motion 20544 in the name of Jamie Hepburn on the Consumer Scotland Bill at stage one. Can I invite those members who wish to take part in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Jamie Hepburn to speak to move the motion. Minister, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Lest I forget to do so at the conclusion of my opening remarks, uh, please let me move the motion in my name at this uh, juncture. I am uh, very pleased, President Officer, to be here to open uh, the Stage 1 debate on the Consumer Scotland Bill. This is a, a small bill, but it is one with enormous potential for the benefit of the people of Scotland. In 2015, ahead of the devolution of consumer advocacy and advice powers, the Scottish Government formed a working group on consumer and competition policy to explore how Scotland could best use its new powers for the good of consumers here in Scotland. The group brought together experts from across Scotland and indeed the UK, from Trading Standards, from Sister Advice Scotland and from Witch and others, and his work was supported by a series of expert panels drawn from regulators, academics and public services. I want to, at this stage, President Officer, place on record my sincere thanks to those who willingly gave their time and effort to the work of that group. As a result of this activity, the review of uh, Scotland's consumer protection landscape was comprehensive and informed by those who understand both the history of consumer protection and its current challenges. Uh, the group's key recommendation was the establishment of a dedicated consumer champion that would speak up for consumers and represent their interest to policymakers, to regulators and to industry. And this has brought us today, where we debate this Consumer Scotland Bill. Since that recommendation, the idea of Consumer Scotland has been tested rigorously. The expectations have remained consistent. A body that can unite a fragmented landscape, a body that can make better use of data to identify and tackle harm, and a body that can focus on the most complex problems and find solutions. Uh, this bill, I believe, establishes that body and goes further by also establishing a consumer duty that will increase the consideration given to consumers by relevant public authorities. Uh, before I talk about the, the bill in a, a little more detail, I also want to offer my thanks to the Economy Energy and Fair Work Committee for their scrutiny at stage one. I am pleased that their report recognises the need for a new consumer body and endorses the general principles of the bill and recommends to Parliament that they be agreed. I have provided a written response to the committee on their recommendations and I look forward to a further discussion of the report and the bill in general this afternoon. I must also thank those who provided evidence to the committee and particularly those who have been instrumental in testing and developing the proposals for Consumer Scotland. We have reached this position as a direct result of that input. I'm particularly grateful to those who took time to respond to a pre-legislative consultation or who came to our consultation events. The vast majority of respondents agreed that Consumer Scotland was needed and that our proposals for the body and the duty could add genuine value to the current system. Those views were it replicated in the committee's call for evidence as well. The process of scrutiny and testing our proposals and thinking will contribute to refining and enhancing this legislation exactly what our legislative process is for. The case for Consumer Scotland has been made many times, but I will set it out here again today. In proposing the body, I, I recognise that we already operate in a landscape where there are organisations already working hard to protect consumers. They do invaluable work and we owe them our thanks. However, we also know that consumer protection has a, a complex landscape and that since the abolition of consumer focus, there is no longer a single organisation to take a big picture view of the issues facing consumers in Scotland. Neither is there an organisation to coordinate responses to consumer harm so that limited resources are used most effectively. This is the gap that we want Consumer Scotland to fill. The bill provides the legal framework to ensure that Consumer Scotland has the powers and structures to operate effectively and it establishes Consumer Scotland as a, a body with three key objectives to reduce harm to consumers in Scotland, to increase consumer confidence and to increase the extent to which consumer matters are taken account of by public authorities in Scotland. 
To do this, the body will primarily carry out investigations into the most serious issues of consumer harm in Scotland using rigorous evidence gathering and analysis to identify the causes of consumer harm and recommend solutions to government regulators and industry. The Consumer Scotland's work beyond that will increase collaboration across the landscape and ensure consumers have access to high quality consumer advice without itself becoming a frontline advice organisation. The bill is deliberately high level and enabling and does not seek to prescribe how the body carries out its functions. This ensures that Consumer Scotland senior staff and board will have a direct role to shape and prioritise the body's work. But I do recognise that the committee have highlighted this flexibility has resulted in some concern that the body's exact role is not fully understood. I continue to believe that the body itself should have the space to develop its operational activity. However, I am also very clear that the body must work with existing organisations and add value rather than duplicate what's already there. I therefore committed to providing further detail on the form and functions of Consumer Scotland without, of course, restricting the scope for that body to independently establish its own priorities and relationships. But I do seek to offer assurances that Consumer Scotland will be tasked from day one with building strong relationships with consumer organisations and its work programmes and scope of activity will be developed with their input. This commitment is also reflected in the bill, which makes collaboration fundamental to Consumer Scotland. It is both true in its general work and specifically in developing its work plans. Indeed, following the committee's report, I will be strengthening these provisions. As currently drafted, the body can uh, take account of any organisation with a consumer interest but is only required to take account of public bodies with similar functions. The committee and many of those who gave evidence correctly pointed out that there are, of course, many organisations in Scotland, mainly in the third sector, who also work to protect consumers. The committee therefore recommended, and I agree with them, that Consumer Scotland should be required to consider the work of other bodies beyond the public sector with the same or similar functions as Consumer Scotland. We will bring an amendment forward to address this. The committee made a, a number of other recommendations too. As I've committed to in my response to the committee, I will give detailed consideration to them all. However, I want to highlight two more in my opening statement just now. Firstly, the Scottish Government accepts the committee's recommendation that the bill should revisit the definition of vulnerability to ensure it reflects that it can take many forms and is often about context, not simply characteristics of individual consumers. Although the bill sets out that the examples provided are illustrative and not exhaustive, it's clear that the text has caused some concerns. So I uh, have committed to exploring an amended definition to assuage such concerns, and I will be very happy to work with committee members and indeed any member with an interest as how best to achieve that. Secondly, the committee noted that many challenges faced by consumers also apply to people running small businesses and recommended an amendment to broaden the definition of consumers to address these concerns. As business minister, I am, of course, very keen to support Scotland's businesses in any way I can, and I commit to ensuring that the concerns of small businesses are recognised. And again, I will be very happy to work with the committee around how best to achieve that aim. President Officer, establishing the legislative framework is only one part of the journey to deliver Consumer Scotland. There is also significant practical work needed to ensure the body is ready by April 2021. If the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Bill, that activity will increase as a first step. We will, presuming Parliament agrees this evening to the general principles of the Bill, begin the appointments process for the new Chair. This will ensure that the future leaders of the body are able to take decisions around the body's work as soon as possible. And more importantly, it will mean that the leadership can be involved in building the relationships with other consumer-focused organisations that will be vital for its success as a body. We'll also take practical steps to ensure that the consumer duty we have proposed has a meaningful impact. We are the first nation in the United Kingdom to develop and propose such a duty, and we have done so in response to the support demonstrated 
through the Consumer Scotland consultation. Together, the duty and the body will ensure that consumers are protected from unintended consequences of policy making and that their potential to drive change is recognised and encouraged. And as with the body, the duty will be de developed collaboratively. I am aware, of course, that the danger it becomes a, a token gesture or another burden for public authorities to deal with. That is, of course, something I want to avoid. And that's why the bill requires the authorities to whom it potentially applies have to be consulted upon. And I will ensure that this consultation is meaningful and allows those affected to shape how the duty works in practice. The presiding officer, establishing a, a new consumer body and a consumer duty for Scotland is both an opportunity and a challenge. An opportunity to put consumer fairness more squarely at the centre of policy and regulatory decision making and a challenge for politicians, regulators and business leaders to respond positively to that. I will continue to work uh, across this chamber, especially with the committee, to ensure that the legislation does all that it can to make that happen and establishes a body and a duty that drives real change both for individual consumers and for the organisations that work to protect them. President officer, I recognise that there are other areas the committee that has raised that uh, I haven't touched upon in opening today's debate. They will doubtless come up over the course of our deliberations today and I will try and respond in closing. But I make this offer here and now. If any member wants to discuss how to improve this bill, I will gladly meet them to do so. President officer, we have an opportunity to improve the position of consumers in Scotland. We have the opportunity to do that collectively and I hope we take that opportunity by passing this bill at stage one this evening. And thank you, Minister. And I now call Gordon Lindhurst to speak on behalf of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee. Convener, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. There can be little doubt that consumer spending has a significant impact on the economy, for we are all consumers after all. The late Roger Scruton said the label belonged to, and I quote, whoever realizes the use value of a good, say by eating food, by hanging and admiring a picture on his wall, by wearing clothes, end of quote. Indeed, we all buy things in shops and online. We choose energy tariffs. We compare insurance policies. We switch phone providers. We book train tickets. We pay direct debits. Sometimes we'll seek to get our money back. We may have problems with the things that we buy and that we try to use. We might even feel like we've been exploited or scammed. As the minister has outlined, the Consumer Scotland Bill seeks to strengthen the rights of consumers through the creation of a new public body. And the intention of this new body is to strengthen consumer advocacy and advice and to identify how and why consumers experience harm in Scotland and to help mitigate that harm. Therefore, uh, it is a welcome bill but in many ways it has raised more questions than it answered. Stakeholders, witnesses and committee members broadly supported the bill in principle with many telling the committee that there were gaps in current advice and advocacy provisions. However, one could be forgiven for questioning what the bill actually does and what difference this new body will make to Scottish consumers in practice. With limited detail on the face of this bill about the overall structure uh, and the operational model and activities con of Consumer Scotland, witnesses had different ideas of what Consumer Scotland's priorities should be. A wish list of work program priorities emerged with research, product recall, quality assurance of advice and alternative dispute resolution all being highlighted as worthy areas for Consumer Scotland's attention. How the new body would interact with existing bodies which already work in this area was a further area of debate. Consultant Sarah O'Neill told us, and I quote, Consumer Scotland will want to set out criteria for why it will do certain pieces of work and why they are important. For example, what is the level of detriment? How many people will it affect? Is anyone else working on it? 
Now, the Minister offered assurances that Consumer Scotland will collaborate with existing bodies to avoid duplication, but it remained unclear how this would be done. The Committee has asked the Minister to outline further detail on the form and functions of Consumer Scotland, including how it will interact with other bodies in advance of Stage 2. We welcome the Minister's commitment to do so. The Committee believes that the Scottish Government must ensure that this new body operates in a way that strengthens and doesn't impede the current work of existing bodies. We saw concern from bodies such as Citizens Advice Scotland that their role could be weakened. And it remains unclear how Consumer Scotland's proposed advice and advocacy role will impact on the future role of Citizens Advice Scotland and its Bureau network. Further questions were raised about respective remits and what that would mean for long-term funding. Many noted difficulties in separating consumer issues from other forms of advice as people can often experience problems in clusters. The committee recommended that the bill's duty to collaborate is extended beyond public bodies to include third sector advice organizations, including CAS. And I am pleased to say the minister agrees and has committed to bringing forward an amendment at stage two. On a different matter, there was concern among some witnesses that Consumer Scotland should have greater influence on trading standards and enforcement issues. Consumer enforcement, including trading standards powers, are reserved to the UK government, which led some to question how Consumer Scotland could seek to influence these areas. Matters of competition are also reserved, but equally they are of great importance to how the consumer landscape operates. The committee explored how information sharing with organisations like tra trading standards could benefit Scot Consumer Scotland's proposed evidence-led strategic role, given that background. I will now move on to the issue of the consumer duty. The bill creates a requirement for certain public bodies to consider the impact of their decisions on consumers. The Scottish Government considers this to be an important development in embedding consumer interests across policy areas and balancing what can at times seem like conflicting interests. So far, so good. However, with the danger of sounding repetitive, many witnesses supported the idea of a consumer duty, but were unclear about what that would involve, who it would involve, and what impact it would have. Neither the nature of the duty nor the processes for it are specified in any detail in the bill, although Consumer Scotland would have a statutory duty to publish guidance. Citizens Advice Scotland said, and I quote, the bill as presented is too greatly focused on the single output of creating Consumer Scotland and too little is said about how this action creates a better outcome for citizens in terms of an enhanced system to better protect their interests. The Minister told the committee that the duties design and implementation will again be carried out collaboratively to avoid it becoming either a token gesture or an administrative burden. So we await the outcome of these discussions. And I, I'm sure that some of my colleagues will go into some of these issues in greater depth. Now, on a, another point, many witnesses were critical that the bill's definition of consumer excludes individuals acting in a business capacity, and the minister mentioned that in his opening remarks. For example, sole traders who run their own businesses will not be covered, and neither will small or micro businesses. Some witnesses told us that small businesses often face the same disadvantages as individual consumers in their knowledge of markets, their bargaining power, and their ability to enforce their rights when things go wrong. FSB Scotland identified the following, and I quote, from banking to online scams, from parcel delivery to energy and water contracts, the vulnerability of smaller businesses as consumers who can often find themselves the victims of unfair and exploitative behavior. 
The committee believes that many challenges faced by consumers are equally, if not more, applicable to people running small businesses. These people often have limited resources to pursue complaints and may also be suffering additional detrimental impact on the ability to run their own business. And the Minister has committed, of course, to exploring these issues with interested parties, and I welcome that. In closing, the committee received 54 written submissions to our call for views, and we heard from 19 witnesses across four meetings. And of course, it is always important to the committee's work to hear these, these views from individuals, businesses, and others in any work that we do. So we thank everyone who informed our scrutiny of the bill. And to turn to another um, part, perhaps, of the political constellation from the one that I started with, According to President John F. Kennedy, and I quote, consumers by definition include us all. They are the largest economic group, affecting and affected by almost every public and private economic decision. Yet they are the only important group whose views are often not heard. Deputy Presiding Officer, the committee approves the general principles of this bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Linters. I now call Dean Lockhart to open for the Conservatives. Mr. Lin uh, Mr. Lockhart, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy <laughs> Presiding Officer. Uh, let me also start by adding my thanks to the committee uh, clerking team, the witnesses, and all those who gave evidence at stage one of the bill. The Consumer Scotland Bill is enabling legislation setting out the framework for the creation of Consumer Scotland, a body with the primary objective of providing consumer advocacy and advice. These powers were devolved to this Parliament following the Scotland Act 2016. We, of course, support the devolution of those powers and we will support the general principles of this legislation today. But at the same time, we will be asking the Minister to take action on the recommendations set out in the committee report and I, was, uh, I welcome his positive uh, response in his opening remarks to um, the committee recommendations and we look forward to working together with the Minister to address some of the concerns. Um, with that in mind, let me highlight some of the key recommendations from the committee uh, that we will be looking for the Minister to respond to. First, the definition of consumer and identifying those who will benefit from the legislation. During evidence sessions, a primary area of concern was the definition of consumer in the bill and whether the protections afforded by the legislation would extend beyond individuals to small businesses whose needs in many respects are identical to individual consumers. The bill currently defines consumer as an individual who purchases goods or services which are supplied in the course of business carried out by the other person supplying them, provided that the consumer is not acting wholly or mainly in the course of a business. So the committee's reading was that at the moment the bill would not uh, afford protection to those acting as small as sole traders or as small or micro businesses and they would be protected, uh, excluded from the protections of the legislation. The Federation of Small Business wrote to the committee specifically on this issue. They highlighted that half of all new businesses are based in homes and over one in 10 Scottish workers are now self-employed. The FSB further explained that when purchasing goods and services, the smallest business often finds itself at a disadvantage because of their lack of expertise in making informed purchasing decisions, their lack of time to research the market and a lack of power on their behalf and poor bargaining power. But because they are excluded from certain legal safeguards which protect individual consumers, smaller businesses often find themselves with fewer protections. We heard other evidence supporting these concerns. Shetland Council highlighted that the definition of consumer excludes small business, of which there are many in remote rural areas and island uh, communities, even though they often purchase goods and services in a manner very similar to those of individual consumers. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, there is um, a call from the committee to include small micro businesses uh, in the definition of consumer, and there is relevant precedent for this. Um, we heard evidence from Jonathan Lenton of Ombudsman Services, who informed us that the Financial Ombudsman Service 
ex has expanded its remit to cover businesses with up to 50 employees. I'm not quite sure the committee thinks 50 is the, the right definition here, but we also heard evidence that the Ombudsman Service itself currently deals with micro-businesses which are defined as businesses with 10 or fewer employees. And to, that, to my mind, that might be a good starting point if we are looking at extending the definition to small business, but that's obviously something we can discuss further down the line. Uh, so that's why the committee uh, did support the calls to include uh, sole traders and smaller micro-business in the definition of consumer. As I said, I was here pleased to hear the minister uh, open to this suggestion in his opening remarks and look forward to working with him in stage two to broaden the definition in this respect. The committee also uh, recommended that there be clarity on how the new Consumer Scotland Agency will avoid overlap and duplication with existing public bodies. On a related point, the committee has also recommended that Consumer Scotland be empowered to support the work of existing consumer protection bodies. For example, evidence was given by Citizens Advice Scotland that their role in financing may be compromised as a result of the introduction of Consumer Scotland. And the committee recognized these concerns surrounding the potential impact on the work and the financing of Citizens Advice Scotland. I supported the committee's recommendation, uh, which called on the Scottish Government to clarify Consumer Scotland's role in relation to advice provision and, and I, I'll read out the recommendation, in light of the expectation that Citizens Advice Scotland will lose its levy-related funding worth approximately £1 million uh, in 2019-20 with no commitment from the, from the Scottish Government beyond this. So I think there is some concern about the introduction of um, the, this new consumer body and how it will impact others already providing advice, including Citizens Advice Scotland. To address some of these concerns, the committee has recommended a Scottish Consumer Protection Partnership be created to support better communications and coordination between the different agencies involved in consumer protection in Scotland, including this new agency. And I look forward to the Minister perhaps addressing some of these issues in his closing remarks. Deputy Presiding Officer, questions were also raised in relation to the financial memorandum of the bill. Evidence from Energy Action Scotland suggested that the proposal for 20 staff with a budget of uh, £2.5 million would not be sufficient for the new agency to properly carry out all of the functions it will be responsible for. Energy Action Scotland highlighted the following uh, when it said, we're already seeing so many issues mount up for the agency to deal with. We need to be more explicit in the bill about its role and be more real realistic about the budget. Now, we're not in the business of advocating significant more money for another public quango. However, we do think there has to be a realistic match between the expectations, uh, the role and the functions of this new agency and the funding and staffing resources it will be able to rely on. Um, and again, look forward to the minister perhaps addressing some of the questions about budget and resourcing of the new agency in his, either in his closing remarks or if he wants a bit more time to think about it um, at stage two at uh, the committee. Finally, Deputy President Officer, the committee heard evidence, and I think the minister himself recognised this, that much greater clarity is required on the scope of the legislation and the exact circumstances in which it would afford consumer protection. So I ask the minister in his closing remarks to clarify if the consumer protection legislation would apply to protect consumers in the following circumstances. Consumers who don't have super fast broadband as a result of the Scottish Government missing its targets for the rollout of super fast broadband. The thousands of train passengers who can't get on overcrowded trains every day. Uh, ferry passengers passengers across Scotland who have suffered 80,000 ferry cancellations, uh, the 14,000 Scottish students who have applied to university but who were rejected because of the SNP student cap, I will in a second. These are, there's a long list here, but time will uh, uh, restrict me in uh, listing uh, a huge number of potential consumers who would benefit from this, but I'll give way, if I have time, I'll, I'll give way to the Minister if, I, if I've got time, Deputy President. Well, it's so intriguing. I, I think uh, I'm happy to extend this. Uh, to Good. Hear the response to the Minister. <laughs> was the, the point uh, I would make, the fundamental point I would make, of course, is that we want to create a, an organisation that's independent, can set its own priorities, look at the issues of 
greatest consumer harm. So potentially it could look at these issues. It could also look at the UK government's failure to regulate uh, deliveries uh, into the Highlands and Islands as well, for example. Mr Lockhart. Well, I, I look forward to that, Minister, because I think there are a huge number of consumers in Scotland who badly need protection and who have been badly let down. Uh, those were, were just uh, some of the examples I mentioned earlier. But, uh, Deputy President Officer, I, we will be supporting the general principles of this legislation at stage one, and I look forward to working with the Minister to explain the exact operation and function of this new consumer body going forward. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Richard uh, Leonard to open for Labour. Mr Leonard, please. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'd like to use the time that I've got to uh, probe the Minister to try to get some transparency where there is opaqueness and some clarity and substance where there is silence and spin. And I have to say gently to the Minister that the, that the burden of proof to demonstrate the case for Consumer Scotland rests on your shoulders. This is a government bill with the force of government behind it. And many of us here are open-minded. We broadly embrace the idea, but we have yet to be convinced by legislation which is largely flat and pedestrian. We want to see a passive state uh, give way to the active state. Of course, there are some especially acute consumer issues in Scotland, like the additional cost of delivery charges imposed on people in the north of Scotland and the islands. Parcel surcharging which raises fundamental questions about where a service like this ought to sit between the public and the private sector. What the role for average versus marginal pricing is in the charging regime of those services. And where our commitment to the universal obligation is anymore. Similarly, where is that commitment to universality when it comes to the establishment of a comprehensive broadband network across Scotland or mobile phone coverage across Scotland. And so what rights do consumers and entire communities have to equal access? And where they exist, how can those rights be realized and where necessary enforced? The objectives of Consumer Scotland have not yet been defined. There are some uh, ideas like the duty to vulnerable customers, which is welcome, but the definition is not inclusive enough. And I welcome the minister's uh, comments this afternoon to revisit that definition. The objectives of the new body should not just be based simply on a desire, and we've heard the language again this afternoon, on a desire to eliminate harm alone. It should be more proactive not just concerned with consumer protection alone, but with consumer benefit. And we also need to consider the very definition of consumer itself, because consumers are not just individuals, but are also communities who collectively receive or are affected by markets operating well or failing badly. So Consumer Scotland should define consumers to include communities of interests and of place, that will be important to ensure that it can best assist those communities. It is suggested that the new Consumer Scotland Agency would have a research focus, and that might be useful in an evidence-led approach to consumer detriment and consumer benefit. But isn't a lot of that useful evidence already collected and presented to us by Citizens Advice Scotland. And therein lies a wider point, which I think we will return to again and again this afternoon. Can the minister tell us where will the added value be in this proposal to the already existing excellent work of Citizens Advice Scotland? Citizens Advice Scotland has a crucial role. Yes, of course. Minister. One of the most obvious and immediate benefits, of course, will be being a statutory entity, it will be at a point of its, its statute powers to demand information from certain organisations to collate that, to identify some of the issues that he has raised, which I'm sure, even though we've not established it yet, the prospective consumer Scotland will be listening very closely to Mr Leonard to hear some of the important issues of concern he's raised that it may want to take forward. Richard Leonard. Uh, I thank the uh, Minister for that um, response, which is, again, I think is, is helpful and constructive. There is a question, though, that still remains to be answered, 
which is uh, around the potential loss of resources uh, to Citizens Advice Scotland, which is after all funded by a levy arrangement. And I wonder whether then the, first, the, the Minister will be able to uh, give us a guarantee or some assurance uh, that there will be a long-term funding plan put in place by his government with Citizens Advice Scotland. We need to know as well, uh, will Consumer Scotland have full statutory powers, including statutory powers of inquiry and investigation? Will it be able to lay reports directly before this parliament, including recommendations about both primary... Yes, sure. Minister. Just to be clear to Ms. Lair, not only will it be able to, as set out in the face of this bill, it will have to, that will be one of the duties placed upon it to report on any investigation is included and on an annual basis and on a three yearly basis the state of the consumer generally in Scotland all those things will have to be placed before Parliament at a point of statute so it's not just a case of Consumer Scotland being able to it will be obliged to do those things. Richard Leonard. Um, th the point I was in the middle of making though was will it also be entitled uh, and indeed required uh, to make recommendations about both primary and secondary legislative action being considered by this Parliament. And if it has powers to demand information from public bodies, how will that be underpinned and enforced? What powers of enforcement will it have? In other words, will it be a watchdog which barks but does not bite? We need to know the extent to which it will be able to uh, demand information and cooperation from all uh, public bodies and indeed other parties uh, who supply in the public realm as well. Um, if there is to be a new consumer duty on public bodies, who will operate this? What will its relationship be with the regulators, some of which are reserved but others uh, are not? How will it interact with those existing consumer bodies uh, and existing regulators? How will it interact with them in practice? Will it encourage collaboration and coordination? What will the lines of accountability be to government and more importantly to this parliament? These are some of the fundamental questions which need to be properly and fully answered before this government bill uh, can progress with the wholehearted confidence of this parliament. So I look forward to the minister providing parliament with those answers we will play a constructive role, but we will not shirk our responsibilities of scrutiny. And if uh, the minister believes this information is all in the bill, uh, he should tell that to organisations of great repute like the Law Society of Scotland, who have raised significant questions about gaps in the legislation as it stands. No, I will not give way because I'm just uh, concluding my remarks. So we will be critics. We. We, we will be critics, not because we want this new consumer body to fail. We will be critics precisely because we want it to succeed. Thank you very much, Mr Leonard. I call Andy Whiteman to be followed by Alex Cole-Hamilton. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much indeed, Presiding Officer. And I want to first start by thanking all the uh, clerks of the committee and, and Spice and all those who gave evidence um, on this uh, bill. Uh, I have to be honest and say that when this bill was introduced, I was sceptical of the need for it. Um, Scotland's not had, of course, a statutory body concerned with the consumer affairs since the demise of the Scottish Consumer Council in 2008, which, of course, was set up by the, the, by the UK Parliament. Um, and my actual recollections of that body uh, actually include its very effective engagement in around 2000 uh, that led up to the abolition of feudal tenure, because the Council, the Con Consumer Council, identified this as an important consumer issue as the owners of homes were subject to unfair and archaic and arbitrary feudal burdens imposing private regulation uh, on their use of their homes. And I remember the council's perspective being an extremely valuable one, coming from perhaps a rather unexpected source. Um, and so I'm very sympathetic to the need uh, to have a statutory consumer body. Of course, we need to discuss its uh, detailed powers, uh, of course. Um, and I am also reminded that Scotland's got a long history of statutory uh, consumer uh, uh, law dating back to long before the union um, uh, someone drew my attention to the sumptuary laws. Uh, these were laws that regulate the private consumption of goods. And in 1433, an act of the Scottish Parliament limited the use of pies and baked meats to those who held the rank of baron or higher. 
1471, the Parliament restricted wearing silk to knights, minstrels, heralds, high-ranking burgesses and those in receipt of £100 of annual rent. Mr Stevenson, I think, knows all about this. I'm not sure if he does. Indeed. And, um, of course, we had important case law. Uh, members will be very, very familiar with the case of Donoghue versus Stevenson, uh, the snail and the ginger beer, uh, which went to the House of Lords and, of course, confirmed the duty uh, that of care uh, that people who supply goods in markets have to consumers in such circumstances. And, of course, the bill before us today is not so prescriptive. It will create a new body in a complex consumer protection and, and advice landscape at a time, I think it's important to say, when society is questioning the fundamental nature of consumption and how it impacts on the wider world. Um, I want to thank the academics uh, who gave evidence to this committee on the question of consumption and, and consumers, uh, and we'll say something about that. And I will be wanting to speak to the Minister precisely about those areas. Uh, I welcome his commitment to have those kind of discussions leading up to stage two. Um, the bill as it stands is framed in terms of reducing harm to consumers, without, I don't think, adequately defining what kind of harm that might be, whether it be financial, emotional, direct or indirect, deliberate, unintended, uh, etc. And I think the concept of well-being, which indeed the First Minister was talking about just yesterday, I think uh, would be a much more positive ambition for the new body in relationship to the question. Yeah. Minister. I, I mean, I agree with the fundamental premise of, of what he's laying out, but would he not accept in setting out that it's about reducing consumer harm it would actually encompass all of those things that he has just laid out. If we start to constrain it further, then by omission, it might start to leave out other areas that we have not thought of, an unintended consequence, perhaps. Andy White. Yes, no, that's a very fair point, and I don't think we should be um, seeking to amend a bill that uh, risks by, uh, leaving things out by omission, absolutely. And uh, uh, obviously, any conversations we have would, 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 would focus on that kind of uh, technical uh, question. Um, I want to now turn to the question of consumers and consumption, because uh, consumer, of course, is a broad category, as members already intimated. Uh, consumers in cafes are consumers in healthcare, patients are, train passengers, and people can consume in groups and through uh, their role in businesses. We also must make sure that the definition of the vulnerable consumer is not so narrow that it excludes those experiencing other vulnerabilities, such as young people experiencing financial vulnerabilities. They transition from being in education to supporting themselves. And that's another area where, in fact, we need to look at the question of uh, drafting and the question of emissions that the uh, minister has just raised. Um, and it's important also to emphasize that consumption is not a neutral activity. Consumption impacts on the world around us, on the environment, for example, through excessive consumption and harmful consumer choices. For example, the Scottish Infrastructure Commission report published this week points out that a major challenge in transforming energy usage is persuading customers to change from the familiar and effective to something new. And changing behaviour is cr critical if we're to meet our climate uh, ambitions. Making ethical choices also should be ingrained in our markets. Ethical consumer movements can greatly impact on business practices uh, as well. Now, the bill, in our view, does not adequately address where peer-to-peer -peer markets, for example, or the reuse and recycling of goods fits into definitions of consumers and consumptions. Supporting the circular economy and the sharing economy is just as important if we're to meet climate targets. And in addition, consumers who are participating in these markets, whether they're borrowing a tool from a tool library or buying a product made from waste products, also need to be protected. And this is particularly important as online platforms continue to disrupt the traditional markets. And we have, of course, a proposed consumer, uh, rather, a circular economy bill soon to reach Parliament, and that will reinforce the economic and environmental benefits uh, of a circular economy. And therefore, focusing just on the definitions in Section 23 of the bill, I think we have quite a bit uh, of work uh, to do. To sum up, uh, Presiding Officer, I think we, uh, obviously, we do welcome uh, this bill. Uh, we must make sure it's fit for the Scotland in the future. Scotland with a modern economy, with net zero emissions, and a Scotland where the priorities of people are placed above those of the corporate body, of, the, of corporate bodies, not the corporate body. Uh, so, uh, Greens will be supporting this motion this evening, and we look forward to having conversations with the Minister uh, in the run-up to stage two. Thanks, President Officer. Thank you very much, Mr. Whiteman. I call Alex Cole Hamilton before we move to the open debate and Gordon MacDonald. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I'm new to this. I obviously don't sit on the committee, but I have been following it with interest. So I'd like to echo uh, thanks that have been given to the clerks and other committee members. You've uh, worked very hard to get to this point. 
Um, and anything, presiding officer, that offers enhanced protections to your constituents and to my constituents is very welcome. And the creation of this new body certainly has potential, uh, but it needs to add value as well to whatever exists uh, rather than to duplicate it or to displace it. And there is a, a well-established ecosystem, as we have heard in this debate, in which this body will be formed and will be operating. It remains unclear in the bill how Consumer Scotland would un interact with these bodies, so I look forward to further clarification um, in the Minister's remarks. I think there are still some outstanding issues. Citizens Advice Scotland, who we've heard a lot about this afternoon, uh, do do valuable work, and they work in my constituency. I know that they work in many of your constituencies um, as well, and they work on everything from social security, housing, employment and relationships. It helps hundreds of thousands of Scots each year who find themselves in tricky situations. And each week in my constituency surgery, people come through the door with problems ranging from water or broadband issues, tenancy bills, uh, and I regularly depend on the outstanding services that those CA, um, Citizens Advice employees offer my constituents and indeed offer me done a huge amount, for example, on fuel poverty, both calling for greater investment and building the coalitions and calculations that underpin that work. And statistics yesterday showed just how vital uh, that is with the first increase in fuel poverty that we have seen as a country these past five years. So it is vital work. What I don't want to see with the emergence of a new governmental organization like Consumer Scotland is an impact where others feel like they need to moderate the good work that they are already doing. Scotland is a better place if organisations have the licence and resource to challenge government rather than just be creatures of it. And they should be the critical friend of the public sector. They, their first and only loyalty should be to ordinary people, those people that you and I all represent. But we have seen in other sectors the chilling effect that can result from the fear of losing a contract or funding or being beholden to government. Organisations can be made to feel they have to hold back and reserve their criticism or even cosy up to the administration. We cannot allow that for this vital consumer organisation. It isn't healthy. As it stands, the creation of a whole new system through this bill does not take proper account of those other organisations in Scotland that play that important role in the consumer landscape. It's another reason uh, why we need assurances that this new body will add value and something new, because there are massive challenges ahead, and we all know that starts with Brexit. There are around 90 directives and regulations, presiding officer, that make up the body of the EU's consumer protection laws. They, are, they cover car hire, holidays, restaurants, product quality advertising. Each of us rely on them every single day of our lives, even if we don't realise it. And they are all legislated for through the European Union. But outside the single market, protections could easily be diluted. Trade agreements could expose our markets to forces that are working against the interests of British consumers. Chlorinated chicken is eye-catching, perhaps even eye-watering, but it's only the beginning. I wonder when trade deals are in the balance, what sacrifices might be made. And I also wonder how we will be able to stay in touch with European agencies and reflect on their advice and support, which is often proven to be so effective. What, for example, will happen with the weekly alerts that we've come to rely on about dangerous products? So we do need strong advocates for consumers and ones that are also willing to campaign for change and a, a recognition of our changing uh, position in the international landscape. Presiding officer, nowhere is the need for consumer protection greater these days than in emerging online markets. And I hope very much that the minister will take some time in his closing remarks to touch on how Consumer Scotland will protect our consumers in the online marketplace. The Law Society also notes that currently, although Consumer Scotland has been granted power to demand information from other bodies, there is no reciprocal option for Consumer Scotland to help organisations, other organisations, legal cases. I would welcome further information about how these arrangements will work in practice. There is another area where Brexit will have a direct impact. Power is concentrated in the hands of a few, uh, stifling competition and consumer choice. Companies are using our data largely unchecked and there should be a code of ethics around how it is used and a means to call in products that breach it. People aren't making informed choices right now about who they give their data to and they aren't getting anything in return. There should be a mechanism for those people who other companies are profiting from 
to benefit from such big profits, particularly among tech companies who are using their data to make money. If Consumer Scotland's objective of protecting vulnerable consumers is to be fulfilled, then there needs to be a concerted effort uh, to focus on areas not currently covered by organisations like Citizens Advice. And it needs to be a clear and distinctive offer that it brings to Scotland. There is a valuable role, I am clear, that in this new organisation in intervening at a market level where vulnerable people are not being adequately supported. This combination of a people-focused approach already provided by a wealth of organisations alongside a holistic, higher-level approach has the possibility to deliver real, concrete, sustainable improvements for those who need it most. And for that reason, Presiding Officer, the Liberal Democrats will support the general principles of this bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Cole Hamilton. And we now move to the open part of the debate. I call Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Alexander Burnett. Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Since the abolition of the Scottish Consumer Council in October 2008 by the then Labour government, there has been no dedicated Scottish body with responsibility for protecting and promoting the interests of consumers in Scotland. Until its abolition, the Scottish Consumer Council was for nearly 33 years an independent policy organisation which represented consumer interests to policymakers, regulators, service providers and suppliers. This is an important service which has been missing for 12 years. And it's only since the 2016 Scotland Act transferred new powers to this parliament relating to consumer advocacy and advice that the Scottish Government was able to act to help protect consumer interests. When the Scottish Government consulted on this bill in 2018, around half of those who responded said that they found the current consumer landscape in Scotland to be fragmented, complex, disjointed and confusing to navigate. Thomas Doherty of which said in evidence to our committee that the Scottish Government has been very clear and we have all said that there is a confusing landscape for consumers. He went on to say it's not always about inventing something new, it's about ensuring that consumers know where to go, whether that is to the Ombudsman Service for Redress or to Trading Standards or to Advice Direct Scotland. I'm pleased that the Scottish Government recognises this and will develop this new body in collaboration with stakeholders already providing support and advice to consumers today. Presiding officer, we also found in committee that there is a clear need for this body to be dedicated to representing the interests of consumers in Scotland. Responses to the Scottish Government consultation on this bill found there is evidence that in specific markets, Scottish consumers behave differently and have different needs from consumers in the rest of the UK, although there is no mechanism that delivers improved, targeted outcomes specifically for Scottish consumers. Section 4 of the Bill will address that issue, allowing Consumer Scotland to obtain, analyse and review information relating to consumer matters and to undertake investigations into business sectors or practices and to publish reports on any investigation it conducts under this section. Areas that could be investigated range from the importance of rural petrol stations, to which to why Scottish consumers receive more nuisance calls than those in other parts of the UK to the ongoing issue of parcel surcharges. Presiding officer, our stage one report also recommended that Consumer Scotland should have a duty in relation to product recall where it could coordinate and disseminate information around major recalls of faulty products. Electrical Safety First noted that the average success rate of an electrical product recall in the UK is just 10 to 20 per cent. It felt that Consumer Scotland should have a mandatory function to coordinate and disseminate information and advice to consumers on significant consumer safety issues. It said, this is key to ensuring a consistent and effective message is delivered from a single trusted source in a timely manner understands the Minister's view and the evidence which he gave to committee that Consumer Scotland would be unable to issue edicts about the recall of products. That said, I'm pleased that he went on to acknowledge that the body would be able to conduct, conduct investigations into the issue and make recommendations on how the Scottish Government and others should respond. 
I appreciate the Scottish Government's subsequent response to our Stage 1 report also stated on the specific issue of recall duty, the Scottish Government believes that in practical terms, the bill as drafted would allow Consumer Scotland to take the lead in coordinating a Scotland-wide response to product recalls. I very much welcome the Scottish Government recognising the role that this bill has the potential to play in improving product recall. This new organisation will recognise and understand our distinct circumstances, such as our rural population and our local industries. And Consumer Scotland will move beyond simply highlighting problems and be focused on seeking solutions that can make a real difference to the lives of consumers in Scotland. Presiding Officer Sue Davis, Head of uh, Consumer Protection at Consumer Group, which said, Scottish consumers have told us about how chronic problems across vital industries are negatively impacting their day-to-day -day lives, from diminishing everyday banking services to patchy telecom connections. Our research has shown trust in these sectors is dwindling, so the need for a dedicated consumer body backed by the Scottish Government is clear. Presiding officer, this bill will create an independent champion for the consumer in Scotland, a champion that will aim to reduce harm to consumers, increase confidence among consumers in dealing with businesses supplying goods and services, and increase the extent to which consumer matters are taken into account by public bodies in Scotland. And when this legislation is passed, we will once again have a distinctive Scottish organisation safeguarding the consumers of Scotland. Thank you. I've got a wee bit of time in hand for interventions, if anyone's so inclined, and I call Alexander Burnett, followed by Willie Coffey. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I note my register of interest in regards to businesses that supply goods and services to consumers. So can I start by echoing other members and add my thanks to my colleagues and the clerks in the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee, witnesses and all those who gave evidence to the bill in this first stage. The Scottish Conservatives welcome the aims of the bill which seek to reduce harm to consumers in Scotland, increase confidence amongst consumers in Scotland in dealing with businesses that supply goods and services to consumers, and increase the extent to which consumer matters are taken into account by public bodies in Scotland. Now, while supportive of this bill in principle, the Scottish Conservatives have concerns about the extent of powers the new body is due to have. And at this time, we believe the bill needs to have a more clear definition on the scope of the power of Consumer Scotland would have, particularly when there are already other organisations providing such support. And I note that the committee also agreed with this point and stated in their stage one report that they believe the minister should outline in further detail the form and functions of Consumer Scotland, including how it would interact with other bodies, so as to ensure there is no duplication of work. Now, I'm sure that members across the chamber will agree that Citizen Advice Scotland are a fantastic network who are well known for their expert network of support to empower people in every corner of Scotland. And as an organisation that provided over 200,000 pieces of consumer advice in 2018 to 2019, I was interested to read their views on this bill. But our small businesses are at the heart of all our local communities, and we must do what we can to ensure that support is provided to them so that they can continue to build all over Scotland. As a great supporter of small businesses, I was pleased to see that Citizens Advice pushed for further support to be provided to them by Consumer Scotland, and noted that healthy micro-businesses are a vital component of inclusive growth, and therefore would like to see the bill amended to include these consumers, all of which I'm glad to see the Economy Committee recognise. And as I said, the great network of advice that Citizens Advice Scotland provide to consumers across the country is well known, and this is recognised by many other organisations too. Energy Action Scotland noted how they provide an important perspective in the consumer landscape, given the breadth and depth of its consumer data. And these consumer insights from the front line help provide evidence, which in turn informs their policy work. Now, as a party, the Scottish Conservatives are proud to build our policies on an evidence-based approach. So I would agree with the Energy Action Scotland's point that citizen advice needs to have more of an involvement in the setting up of a Consumer Scotland body. And this was also a view echoed by Energy UK, who said that further clarification is required around the role of Consumer Scotland and the existing role of, of CAS, particularly with regards to energy. Now, Consumer Scotland's main goal is there to protect consumers. So I note electrical safety first, key recommendations. The bill needs to be strengthened 
to ensure consumer voices are a central part of setting Consumer Scotland's work programme with a requirement for it to consult. Now, any activity which helps ensure that consumers have more of a say in reporting back their proposed issues for further investigation should be incorporated into this bill and therefore into the legislation of Consumer Scotland's powers. Now, I've spoken previously in this chamber uh, about support for regulating electricians and this principle of implementing safe practices applies to electrical goods as well. Research has found that only a third of Scottish consumers currently register their appliances, making it difficult to contact them about recalls. So for Consumer Scotland to be introduced as an investigatory body, as well as an advocacy one, it is important that recommendations of them prioritising investigations into key product safety issues are noted. And as Electrical Safety First noted, in Scotland alone, in just one year, there are over four fires a week caused by white goods. So this is an opportunity for us to assist consumers in protecting themselves from poor quality products, as well as ensuring that cheap products are also safe products. With less than 20% of faulty electrical products being successfully recalled, leaving companies reliant on indirect forms of telling consumers about their faulty products, I note that the committee has agreed it is important for the Minister to consider conferring a duty on Consumer Scotland to coordinate and disseminate information around major recalls of faulty products. So in conclusion, this bill aims to protect our constituents as consumers across Scotland, and a principle I'm sure supported by all. But whilst its aims are something we support at this time, we will be looking for further clarification over the extent of the powers that the body intends to have so as to avoid the duplication of efforts. Thank you. Call Willie Cothy to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thanks very much, President Officer, and thank you, of course, to the Clarkin team for putting together the report that some of us are referring to today in the Chamber. Uh, the Consumer Bill basically came out of the Smith Commission after 2014, and as Gordon MacDonald and others reminded us, the UK Consumer Council was itself abolished 12 years ago in 2008, presumably creating a driver for the discussion that took place in the Smith Commission to do something new and effective for consumers in Scotland. The idea behind the bill is simply to transfer some powers to legislate for the delivery of consumer advice and advocacy in Scotland, to try and reduce harm to consumers, to increase consumer confidence in the whole area of supply of goods and services, and to raise the profile of consumer matters within businesses too. The bill makes the body accountable to the parliament as a focus on supporting vulnerable consumers, which featured in discussions and has been mentioned in the chamber today, and it gives Consumer Scotland the power to require certain bodies to provide information also discussed at some length. The majority of evidence backed the creation of the new body. But naturally enough, when a, a new body is proposed, it will create a discussion around duplication, separation of duties, access to data, and all of that from the other bodies who occupy that space to some degree or other. And the committee heard quite a lot of that during its various sessions. One of the earliest issues raised was about the current fragmentation of consumer advice services, perhaps as a result of that earlier abolition that we've heard about. Consumer protection seems to be spread around a number of organisations, all offering advice and advocacy services. And there was a plea from everyone who gave evidence to try and tidy this landscape up a wee bit, to make clear who does what and how Consumer Scotland will work with those existing bodies. Should the new agency be front and centre, public facing and accessible, offering advice directly? Or should that be left to the existing agencies like Citizens Advice Scotland who perform that duty? With Consumer Scotland focusing on high level strategic issue, issues affecting consumers. The Minister, I understand, favours the latter approach. It will allow CAS to focus on its core role <coughs> of supporting the Business Bureau Network to, to deliver that vital advice to people and to continue to advocate on their behalf. Consumer Scotland will have a broader remit to start building an evidence-based picture of consumer harm and to act as an advocate for change. We've heard some contributions on enforcement powers, which we know are reserved to UK government agencies through trading standards. So while those powers can't be contained within this bill, it's envisaged that Consumer Scotland, as a national body, will use its evidence-gathering function to highlight and advocate for change 
within these other stakeholders. There was some concern here with colleagues from East Ayrshire and Glasgow City telling us that there's a growing lack of capacity and resource available to provide the kind of second tier interventions for people to take action, for example, against retailers. So some concerns do remain there, presiding officer, about how that function can be supported in the future. We've heard a wee bit today also about the product recall and whether Consumer Scotland could play a leading role there. And we heard that Electrical Safety First told us that it's no better than 20% when they issue product recall notices for electrical goods in the UK. Clearly, that's a failing somewhere. So there may be an opportunity for our new agency to help raise awareness of product recalls without becoming the investigating body itself. One important part of the discussion was about who exactly are and what are vulnerable consumers, and some of the members have touched on this again this afternoon. The bill suggested some obvious groups of people, the elderly, infirm people in low incomes, or even people living remotely, but it soon became clear to the members in the committee that vulnerability was more about the context rather than the characteristics. People are more vulnerable, perhaps, after a bereavement, or people online not being fully aware of the myriad of terms and conditions and products for sale, younger people perhaps being a bit more vulnerable to direct and online marketing. So it was pleasing to hear the Minister responding to this one and agreeing to explore the issue further. One of the issues I think that does need some tidying up, President Officer, is the issue about access to data. We heard that the various bodies will be expected to share data with Consumer Scotland to enable it to fulfil its role, and there will be a power to require this to take place. There do appear to be some issues about this in terms of data protection and so on, but I know the Minister has agreed to examine it by further setting up a working group to clarify and simplify this. But having the power to require information to be made available does seem to be supported, certainly by East Ayrshire Council and by others. President officer, could I just say a wee word or two about the online world of retailing and how Consumer Scotland might be able to help consumers in what is becoming a global consumer market? And Alec Cole Hamilton touched on it earlier in his speech. I think it's important that we think about how we protect consumers living in Scotland, but who buy goods and services online, whether it's from Scottish, UK, European or international companies. I think we would all benefit from establishing reciprocal arrangements with other jurisdictions to provide some advice and advocacy support when people need help under those circumstances, post-Brexit or otherwise. It's a global market and redress shouldn't be limited to the country we live in. In summing up, President Officer, the Consumer Bill, I think, is a useful proposal that should help consumers in Scotland. A new national body that seeks to gather information on what matters to consumers and to advocate for improvement across the consumer landscape will surely be a worthwhile objective. I look forward to our continuing engagement as the Bill passes through its stages and to see some clarity and resolution of the many issues raised which, if resolved, will strengthen the Bill even further. Thank you. Jackie Bailey, followed by Richard Lyle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this Stage 1 debate on the Consumer Scotland Bill. Um, like Andy Whiteman, I was sceptical about the need for the Bill when there is already a crowded and confusing landscape. But I've come to accept that perhaps having an overarching body with a role to coordinate rather than duplicate makes some sense. But at this stage, I'm not sure that the government has a clear view on how it should operate, and it's not set out the specific functions of the body, preferring to leave it to Consumer Scotland to work out that detail at a later stage. The committee wasn't entirely convinced of that approach, and I'm pleased to hear that the minister will return at stage two to set some of that detail on the face of the bill. I think that will certainly be helpful. But I want to cover four particular areas in the committee report. The role and importance of Citizens Advice Scotland, including consumers in the new body, the question of definitions, which others have touched on, and finally, the issue of product recall. Let me start with Citizens Advice Scotland, because members will know that Citizens Advice Scotland provides advocacy and advice through a network of local bureaus. 
These bureaus, like the ones in Western Berkshire and Dug Island Butte, provide front-facing community advice. This is supplemented by consumer services on water, energy, post and more, adding up to over 200,000 pieces of consumer advice in the last year alone. The establishment of Consumer Scotland will see resources transferred from CAS to the new body, and whilst the Scottish Government has helpfully said it will provide continued funding, this is only for one year. There is no in-principle commitment beyond that time frame. And I was genuinely surprised, presiding officer, when the SNP members on the committee um, voted to reject my amendment, which was entirely factual, and asked the Scottish Government to consider a long-term funding plan. I am disappointed, and I couldn't help but wonder whether SNP members are allowed to ask the Scottish Government to consider things. Um, surely, SNP members value the work of citizens' advice bureaus and the contribution of their volunteers across Scotland in providing consumer advocacy. Perhaps I am missing something, presiding officer. I am, however, very pleased that colleagues from other parties, and indeed the, the minister himself, um, seems to support this request, and I trust the Scottish Government will be looking at this again. I understand that the Scottish Government is committed to enshrining the role of Citizens Advice Scotland as consumer advocates in legislation, and I think that is a helpful move forward, and I look forward to an amendment coming at stage two. The bill is, however, silent. Indeed. Jamie Hepburn. Let me... First of all, say I, I concur entirely with the point she's making about uh, Citizens Advice Scotland. She will also accept, though, that the recommendation of the committee is to ensure that we consult and, and include uh, a wider range of bodies beyond the public sector, not just uh, Citizens Advice Scotland has got to be beyond that, so that all the relevant organisations are included. I, I'm, delighted Jackie to Bailey. I'm delighted to concede that point, but he will, of course, recognise that Citizens Advice Scotland used to enjoy statutory underpinning until the powers were returned to this parliament and the government neglected to put it in the Consumer Scotland Bill. So whilst I accept the widening um, of the definition, it's important that they're in there too. Um, let me return to what I was going to say next, because the bill is silent on whether consumers will have a voice or be involved in the governance of the new body, nor do they appear to have a role in shaping the work programme, and I think that is a mistake the committee did too. Um, consumers need to be involved at every level, and I would encourage the Scottish Government to do further thinking about this. Let me turn to definitions, because the committee was keen that the definition of consumer as set out in the bill was widened. Firstly, to include small businesses, which is an approach favoured by the Federation of Small Business. Um, typically, micro-businesses have fewer than 10 employees. They probably have more in common with the domestic consumer than larger businesses. They can be equally vulnerable to making poor purchasing decisions or being victims of unfair practice. So they should be included in the bill. Then there is the definition of a vulnerable consumer. Willie Coffey was right. As currently drafted, the committee were of the view that the definition in the bill was too narrow and too restrictive. It shouldn't be just about particular characteristics of the consumer alone, but should also include the circumstances which they may find themselves in that make them vulnerable at that particular point in time. Now, I understand that the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission guidance might be useful for us to consider as they have grappled with this issue already. Last me, lastly, let me turn to the issue of product recall. For shorthand, let me call this the Whirlpool Amendment, which I intend to bring forward at stage two to make the issue absolutely clear. And let me thank Electrical Safety First for their evidence in helping to get us to this point. Because members across the chamber will be aware of a number of product recalls, typically for faulty or dangerous white goods. The reason I say dangerous is that the consequences can be quite severe. As Alexander Burnett said earlier, every week in Scotland, at least four fires are caused by white goods. That's 80% of house fires caused by faulty products. If we think about the Whirlpool example for a minute, just over a million tumble dryers and washing machines have been recalled due to fire risk concerns. Yet not all of them have actually been removed. The average success rate is about 10 to 20 percent. So there are hundreds and thousands of faulty tumble dryers and washing machines remaining a hazard in people's homes. Consumer protection powers are reserved. But we have an opportunity in this parliament to make a positive difference by ensuring that Consumer Scotland 
has a power to disseminate information and advice about major product recalls, a central trusted source of information that can ultimately help reduce the harm that is all too often caused by defective and faulty goods. Presiding officer, I commend stage one of the bill to the chamber and I look forward to the minister taking a leaf out of the cabinet secretary's book um, and I will certainly work with him to improve this bill. Richard Lyle, followed by Tom Mason. Thank you, President Officer. Can I begin this afternoon by welcoming the opportunity to contribute to this important debate on the Consumer Scotland Bill. President Officer, safeguarding consumer interests and making sure they can play a part in building a more inclusive, sustainable economy is a key, I believe, priority of this government. Key to assisting that priority is the actions through the Bill which will include the establishment of a Consumer Scotland and the introduction of a duty on relevant public authorities to have regard to consumer impacts and desirability of reducing consumer harm while making strategic decisions in the course of delivering functions. I'm sure this Scottish Government recognises that the consumer landscape is complex and will ensure that the Consumer Scotland adds genuine value. It must develop in collaboration with stakeholders. Indeed, as well as establishing Consumer Scotland, consumers will be put at the heart of policy making in Scotland through a consumer duty, which also forms part of the bill. The new duty requires that a relevant public authority must, when making decisions to a strategic nature on about how to exercise its, exercise its functions, have regard to the impact of those decisions on consumers in Scotland and the desirability of reducing harm to them. The complexity and fragmentation of the landscape, particularly in relation to consumer advice services, is a concern. Responses to the government's consultation repeatedly, repeatedly suggested that Consumer Scotland should address this. I mentioned already that to ensure it adds value, stakeholder engagement and collaborative working has taken place. Indeed, and indeed stakeholder engagement has been extensive and I'm certain it will continue through the passage of this bill. Another key deliverable from the bill will be the creation of an independent consumer champion dedicated to represent the interests of consumers. Consumer Scotland will act as a consumer champion against the backdrop of a time when we face, in fact, not face, but we are exiting the EU. Rising prices, the climate emergency, rapid, rapid technological advances make it more important than ever that there is a strong voice to champion the interest of consumers and ensure that they are not left behind. Consumer Scotland will move beyond simply highlighting problems to actively seeking solutions that can make a real difference to the lives of consumers in Scotland. We will recognise and understand their distinct circumstances, such as our rural population and our devolved industries. And by enshrining it in statute, we will send a clear signal that the Scottish Government sees consumer fairness as a key part of our wider, fairer Scotland agenda. Crucially, though, as a public body accountable to Parliament, Consumer Scotland will have to demonstrate that it is providing value for public money by driving real change for people in Scotland. The Scottish Government will, I know, continue to work with stakeholders to ensure it does not duplicate existing good work in the consumer protection landscape. In doing so, the Scottish Government will, I'm sure, recognise, for example, that Citizen Advice Scotland has an important place in the consumer landscape and is committed to ensure that they continue to give a voice to many vulnerable consumers. A separate consumer body will allow Citizen Advice Scotland to fo focus on its core role by supporting the Bureau network to deliver advice to vulnerable citizens and to advocate on their behalf. Consumer Scotland will have a broader remit than uh, CAS does. It will have a, the responsibility to build a comprehensive, evidence-based picture of consumer harm across Scotland and identify the solutions needed to tackle, that, tackle this harm. Consumer Scotland advocacy for all consumers will benefit the Bureau by allowing them to focus resources on the consumers who need, need more interventionist support. Another issue I'd like to focus on, uh, President Officer, is the economic importance of consumers. 
Indeed, they are a vital to our economy and to achieve vital policy outcomes like decarbonising our economy and reduce our use of plastic. Some figures estimate that consumers account for 60% of economic spend spending. We cannot grow our economy without them. And we cannot achieve the kind of inclusive growth we want if consumers are not treated fairly or don't feel able to use their spending power to reflect the things that they care about as citizens. We know that a systematic consumer harm or unequal consumer outcomes can have far-reaching consequences. For example, those who live in poverty routinely paying more for essential, essential goods and services. Consumers need a strong champion to challenge these inequalities and to empower them to speak up for themselves. Consumer Scotland will not work alone. It will provide with a variety of organisations that already provides advice and support to consumers such as Citizen Advice Scotland, Advice Direct Scotland and which. Given that the current climate emergency, uh, consumers will be vital if we are to transform our economy to become more sustainable and achieve our carbon emission targets. To do this successfully, consumers must be both supported to change their own behaviour and also to encourage business to change theirs. The establishment of Consumer Scotland and the introduction of the consumer duty will help us to achieve those aims. An example of an area when Consumer Scotland could lead to an investigation is the area I know, like colleagues like Richard Lockhead and others have been particularly, and Gail Ross, and others have been particularly vocal in raising awareness in, the, in this chamber and out with on the issue of parcel deliveries. Indeed, it is true that it's a long-standing detriment suffered by consumers in rural or highland areas who sometimes pay up to 50% more for delivery charges than consumers across the UK. Although reserved to the UK government, reserved to the UK government, the Scottish government has led actions to tackle this, such as developing a statement of principles by use of retailers. However, the problem still persists. A consumer body de dedicated solely to Scottish issues could fully explain the underlying fully explore the underlying causes and propose practical solutions for reducing consumer detriment to businesses and regulatory uh, authorities. In closing, I believe that this is to be welcomed. I note with interest the comments that are made by Carolyn Norman, but actually were set out quite uh, eloquently by my colleague uh, Gordon McDonnell. Uh, but she did say the move to create a dedicated consumer body backed by the Scottish Government to tackle these chronic issues is very positive. That is the mission, that is the ambition, presiding officer, to improve the lives of uh, ordinary people across Scotland. And I welcome the bill and look forward to supporting it. Thank you. I call Tom Mason to be followed by Claire Baker. Thank you, presiding officer. We, we consider an important piece of legislation today. A new consumer protection agency has the potential to help many people across the country and further promote consumer confidence across a variety of business sectors. There are currently a number of organisations that offer similar services, and a new st strat strategy agency, such as the one proposed in this bill, can complement the work of other groups, provide a broader and more effective se selection of advice on unfair trading, harm reduction, and other consumer issues. There have been some issues raised, particularly regarding duplication of work, and how the new agency would fit into the bigger picture here in Scotland, as well as a few other considerations, and I will get onto those in the short while. However, I'm broadly supportive of the bill and its objectives at this stage. In so doing, I think the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for the... I'm sorry, I can, can I thank the Economy, and Energy and Fair Work Committee for their stage one report, as well as considerations undertaken by the Finance Constitution and Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committees. Now, the devolution of powers over consumer advice and advocacy in 216 Scotland Act made it necessary to create a body to deliver such objectives operating alongside ministers and the third sector, as well as the equivalent bodies across the UK. Three, the three overarching aims of this new Consumer of Scotland set out in Section 2 are certainly objectives that I can support. Reducing consumer harm by combating unsuitable trading practices will be of great benefit to people across the country, particularly older or vulnerable people. Increasing confidence in our consumers when dealing with businesses will help put minds at ease and helpfully lead to benefits for both. 
Lastly, ensuring the salience of the consumer of matters will mean that both the state and the private sector are able to respond to the challenges of tomorrow in an agile way. Deputy Presiding Officer, the bill as it stands would ensure Consumer Scotland is subject to independent reviews every five years of its operation. Although I wonder if, given the speed at which market practices can evolve, whether or not this timescale needs to shorten to ensure continual, continual best pra practice. In a similar vein, Consumer Scotland would have to publish a consumer welfare report every three years. For the same reason, I might be inclined to think a shorter time period would be useful, and I hope that some consideration is given to these issues at later stages. External organisations have also raised a few concerns. Yes. Jamie Hepburn. I mean, I'll, of course, be very happy to, to meet with him and consider at that point. I would, of course, observe, though, that it will also be incumbent, as I've made clear to Mr Leonard, for Consumer Scotland to report on an annual basis. So it won't be every three years we're waiting for Consumer Scotland to, to report on the basis that he's laid out. Tom Mason. Oh, thank you for that. I just help enter the debate. External organisations have raised a few concerns about elements of the bill, and I thought I'd rise to touch on these, these, on a few of those. Firstly, I wish to touch on the potential duplication of work done by other organisations in the charitable sector, for instance. The Law Society, in their very helpful briefing, point out there is not sufficient clarity on the functions of the Consumer Scotland. Thus, there is a challenge in, ass in assessing just where Consumer Scotland fits into the overall consumer landscape something I hope that can be addressed during the further stages. The Law Society also has pointed out some specific details that will need clarification in the bill about inf information sharing. I think it is important that Consumer Scotland is able to demand information from, from other bodies, but there should also be a mechanism for the information they collect to be shared outwards. This would ensure a joint, joined up evidence-based approach among all other similar organisations rather than everything going off in different directions based on different data. A number of concerns have been raised about how Consumer Scotland would go about protecting vulnerable people, particularly regarding definition of the vulnerable. As pointed out by Scottish Legal Complaints Commission, the current definition is quite narrow and so may require further clarification if it is to be effective in fulfilling the aims set out by ministers. We need the law governing Consumer Scotland to be all-encompassing as possible. So I hope that these representations from legal organisations will prompt a clarification at the later stages of the bill. I'm grateful to the Citizens Advice Scotland for their contribution to the bill, as well as through their own stage one briefing, as well as submissions to the Eco Economy Committee last year. Their model of working shows us that one of the most vulnerable resources in identifying fundamental problems can be the people who have been negatively affected by consumer issues in the past. By drawing on uh, from people's real life experience, we ensure that the Consumer Scotland can, can prioritise solutions to real problems that are facing every day. The SLCC has pointed out to the establishment of an advisory group, and this seems to be a sensible approach. So I hope the ministers will take, a, m m take such a suggestion on board going, for on board going for forward. CAST has also pointed out an issue regarding their legal status as a consumer advocate, something that is the case in England and Wales, but would not be in Scotland as a result of the bill. So I hope steps can be taken to either clarify or correct this later on. Deputy Presiding Officer, this bill, as set out today, is a good start in creating an agency required to fulfil our obligations under the powers evolved by the Parliament in 216 Scotland Act. I'm pleased to see that some of the ideas that have been set out for this op operational priorities, both in the bill and from the Minister today, and agree that these are the right priorities for consumers across the country. Now, some elements of proposed legislation will need to be improved during, this, during that time. Of course, these are... These are by no means insurmountable and will just require some work done as the bill progresses. So with that in mind, I'm happy to support the general principles of the bill and look forward to seeing how it progresses in committees and beyond. Thank you very much. Claire Baker, followed by Stuart Stevenson. 
Um, thank you, President Officer. Um, I welcome the opportunity to speak in this afternoon's debate on the Consumer Scotland Bill. I would like to thank the committee members for all their work on the Stage 1 report. Um, I'm not a member of the committee, but I do have an interest in consumer issues, and I'm interested to see how the legislation develops. As a previous spokesperson on rural affairs, I remember the scandal of contaminated meat with horse products, where the trust of consumers was severely damaged by a weakness in the inspection regime and the complicated supply chain of processed meat products. Consumer trust is important, and a robust system of advice and redress for consumers is vital in building trust and providing protection. It is important that any new body brings additional value to the current situation. While new powers were devolved, which enables the ability to legislate for the delivery of consumer advice and advocacy, most consumer powers are reserved to Westminster. In a common UK market for goods and services, this makes a degree of sense. But the new power enables the establishment of this new body to address any issues which are specific to Scotland or have a strong Scottish dimension and to provide robust research and a strong advocacy role to influence government. It is worth recognising that while we see this change within the UK, the EU also has consumer powers, as other members have talked about, um, sharing competence for consumer protection with member states, ensuring a baseline standard of protection across the EU and responsibility for product safety and competition. As we leave the EU at the end of this month, there could be a role for Consumer Scotland in identifying any weaknesses or gaps that may develop after the transition period, depending on the level of regulatory alignment we agree on. It is positive that many of the points highlighted by the committee receive a positive response, response from the government at stage one. The committee have secured a number of commitments on the definition of vulnerability, on sole traders and micro-businesses, on the financial memorandum and COSLA, and on the need for the duty to collaborate to include the third sector. So there is much agreement and anticipated work for the committee at stage two. However, the stage one report and the briefings from CAB and the Law Society provided for the debate are all united in their concern that Consumer Scotland's objectives are not defined and external organisations are unclear about how Consumer Scotland will operate. While the Scottish Government argue it will be for the body to set its strategic direction and work priorities, there is a need for greater clarity about how the new body will operate, how it will work with existing consumer bodies and how it will work with regulators which have enforcement powers that the new body won't have. In Scotland, we have established consumer rights organisations, including Citizen Advice Scotland and Consumer Advice Scott, who I spoke to when they were here in the Parliament last week. These are frontline services offering advice and support for consumers who are facing difficulties. It needs to be clear that the new body will not detract from their work and that it will complement it. And this is another reason why the issue of the levy-related funding and CAS needs to be resolved. Most people aren't thinking about influencing government or investigating a sector when they want to complain about a product or look for advice on how to resolve an issue. These will still be the services that consumers want to directly use. And we have to ensure that advice services are properly funded and that the investigative and enforcement services with trading standards officers at our local authorities are also fully resourced. Consumer Scotland will need to work closely with the Competition and Markets Authority. And it is important that structured opportunities for this are created and for other collaborative work. As a member of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee, I recently worked on the Euro 2020 legislation, which included measures to stop ticket touting during the tournament. Ticket touting is a practice which exploits music and sport fans, reselling tickets at inflated prices, creating a profit margin that does not support the artist or the promoter or the venue, but goes into the pocket of unscrupulous dealers and businesses. I recently got a letter from a company which operates a resale platform. While the Competition and Markets Authority undertook a compliance review and forced secondary ticket sellers to comply with consumer law, which makes the process more transparent for the consumer, I completely disagree with the business model used by these companies. The letter I received describes dynamic pricing and argues that concepts such as face value are becoming increasingly outdated and irrelevant. This is absolute nonsense. I don't know any fan who has been happy to be ripped off to secure tickets to a concert when they're sitting in a row where everyone else has paid half the price of that ticket. Is this the kind of gap within our legislation that Consumer Scotland should be focusing on? 
So we recently passed legislation on Euro 2020, but there was a degree of frustration that the legislation only covered the term of the tournament. This was similar to the Commonwealth Games legislation, where the Scottish Government could legislate to, to protect a major event, but it is limited to that time period. In response to these questions during the committee sessions, the Minister Ben McPherson said that consideration was being given to introducing a framework bill, but we need clarity over how this would work with reserved powers. So while there are issues to be addressed around what the Law Society in their briefing describe as what Consumer Scotland will actually do, I would hope this new body can work positively to impact on issues such as tackling the rise of secondary ticket selling in Scotland. We have seen progress through the enforcement of the 2015 Consumer Rights Act, with a recent case from Consumer Advice Scott and East Ayrshire Council's trading standards being the first time that such a fine has been issued in Scotland and the first successful case of its kind in the UK. This tackled a case of a misleading ticket sale and the consumer not having the information they are entitled to. But the current legislation does not restrict the selling of tickets for an inflated price. This is exploitative and I would welcome Consumer Scotland when it is created to work to understand the situation in Scotland and work to propose how we can address it to protect the consumer. Thank you. I call Stuart Stevenson, who is the last contributor in the open debate. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, I think this debate uh, reminds me uh, why at the beginning of this session I asked the Whips if I could get on the Economy Committee. Unfortunately, they put me elsewhere uh, because clearly the work of this committee is both interesting uh, and uh, of value. And this uh, the report they've produced is an example uh, of that. I find myself on Rural and Environment Committees now marking my own report card, reviewing things I did as a minister. A bit odd, but there we are. Uh, but the important point is the 2016 uh, Scotland Act, which has devolved com consumer advocacy and advice to this place, uh, is very much to be welcomed and is the, the foundations of what we're discussing today. But of course, advocacy and advice need not be all that we do. Uh, we can uh, inform as well as advocate and advise. Uh, we can inform uh, manufacturers, we can inform uh, small businesses. The important point is to understand through evidence why consumers experience harm and develop solutions that increase consumer uh, fairness. Thereby, we increase consumer confidence. And I think an important thing to think about is, in this context, we are not setting up something in opposition to manufacturers and suppliers. On the contrary, an informed and demanding consumer that raises the game of suppliers and manufacturers is in the interests of those businesses because it will make them more competitive in their efforts uh, to sell into their local market and to export markets. In other words, good products command a market. So they are not the enemies uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of businesses. Now, just to turn some of the detail, uh, looking at the policy memorandum, I note uh, paragraph 29 that Consumer Scotland will be a body corporate and that one of the things that will be necessary is for there to be an ordering council uh, because the civil service is a reserve matter. And I simply ask the, the minister now or at a later point uh, to perhaps advise um, whether he's engaged with the UK government to get assurance that such consent will be given. I'd be surprised if there'd be any difficulties, but I think just as a matter of uh, uh, completeness. Um, in terms of uh, 20 is paragraph 66 uh, in that uh, same document uh, and elsewhere, we talk about uh, impacts on Highland and Ireland communities and rural communities more generally. And of course, representing a hybrid area that is both uh, very rural, uh, but also uh, significant large towns. I have a particular interest in the application uh, of this to areas that are more distant from city centres. Uh, I see no reason to uh, doubt that there will be benefits uh, there as they are elsewhere. A subject that's come up uh, from a number of people, most notably and recently from Jackie Bailey in relation to white goods, is the issue of product recall. And one of the things I previously have said in this place is we should seek to get the number, the serial number of a white goods 
on the front of the goods because it's actually around the back in every case. You've got to take it out of its installation to find the product number. And I think that's a big contributor to why so many recalls don't actually have high returns because people find it very difficult to find out if their whirlpool or whatever it might be is a subject to a recall. And while we don't have the power to command that, we certainly, through this vehicle, might have the power to persuade and inform and make consumers demand that it happens. Uh, Richard Locke has been made successful on delivery charges. Gordon Lindhurst, in his committee remarks, made uh, mention to it. We've also had mention of the issue of chlorinated chicken. I think that leads us uh, to the issue of labelling of products and their origins, because I think that informs uh, the consumer as to whether the product that they might be contemplating buying, particularly in food, is one which they really uh, want to talk about, uh, want to engage with and, and buy. But uh, we cannot do everything that we might want to do. We can't cut into competition law uh, or operation, but we can certainly assist consumers in making choices. I think also another reserved issue, which nonetheless we could engage in, is trying to help consumers understand what advertising means. And I include in that much of what happens on social media, where the boundary between advertising, comment and information is not always particularly uh, clear. This uh, bill and what will be done is not just about preventing harm, it's about delivering uh, real benefits. Others have talked about citizens' advice. Uh, I strongly support them and there are regular uh, posts that I, I would send my constituents on to uh, when they have difficulties. And I certainly uh, would not wish to see their role diminished in the many communities in which they are represented on the ground with local people as the directors and local people understanding uh, local needs. A central body uh, elsewhere might be less able to engage with direct uh, local issues. Now, let me close, presiding officer, on the issue of vulnerability and vulnerable uh, consumers, which has come up. And one of the interesting things when uh, Andy Whiteman uh, raised the Donoghue versus Stevenson case um, in the, uh, 1929, is that May Donoghue, who pursued that case, actually relied on the informa pauperis. In other words, she was actually a pauper. So therefore she was able, because she was a pauper, to take that case all the way to the House of Lords because she was relieved under that provision of carrying the costs of her opponent should she lose the case. And I think that's a very interesting example, going some distance back, that might inform how we see this new body uh, operate. Um, she was a pauper to the extent that only one of her four sons uh, survived into adult life. She has delivered as the most famous litigant in life a little bit that contributes to this debate. Presiding officer. We move now to the, the closing speeches. I call on Rhoda Grant for uh, up to seven minutes, please. Oh. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, no one disagrees, I think, with the strengthening consumer protection in Scotland, but there's a number of issues in the bill that require clarification. It appears that it's enabling legislation, but the objectives of the legislation are not altogether clear, a point made by Claire Baker, among others, um, that there is no clear view or vision. And it appears to me that there is so much more that needs to be consulted on, and surely that consultation should have been done before the bill was brought forward, albeit that it's welcome at this stage to give some more clarity to the role of, of the, the organisation. <clears throat> A number of people mentioned its interaction with other bodies in the Law Society, did that and the co-op party of which I'm a member also raised that in their briefing before the debate. Um, that it isn't clear how the body is going to interact with existing bodies and regulators who are already tasked with taking enforcement action. And, um, it's, Jim, Jimmy Hepburn in his opening statement did say that he hoped it would unite a fragmented landscape, but I suppose the fear is that it just adds to the clutter of this landscape. Um, so therefore some uh, clarity would be would be welcome. It needs to 
do something new, not simply replicate or replace organisations that are there. And people talked about um, citizens' advice, and I think there was support from around the chamber for the role they play, uh, which is very important. Uh, Jamie Hepburn, in his opening statement, talked about um, Consumer Scotland taking account of the role of the voluntary sector, but it's not, again, clear what that means, because Citizens Advice Scotland will be impacted by the bill, um, and particularly in light of the expectation that they'll lose their levy-related funding, a point made by Richard Leonard. And that's worth about a million pounds. It was worth a million pounds in 1920. And there's no commitment from the Scottish Government beyond 2021. And Jackie Bailey suggested that this funding would transfer from Citizens Advice Scotland to um, a Consumer Scotland. So there is a concern about that because it's very unclear then what the benefits to Citizens Advice Scotland is by this new organisation. And um, they provided um, two, two, 221,000, more than 221,000 pieces of consumer advice um, in 1819, and that's nearly 30% of their work. So if Consumer Scotland is not providing frontline services, will Citizens Advice still be providing that services, service? And if so, how are they going to be funded for make, doing that work? So we have to be very clear that the, this organisation doesn't take over from Citizens Advice Scotland and that they and local authorities who also provide frontline services are properly financed to provide that support. There was discussion about the consumer duty and again that wasn't very clear. It fell to local bodies and I know local authorities are concerned that that might pay, um, place more stresses on them and mean that they have uh, further duties um, to complete. Yes, on that point. Jamie Hepburn. She mentions that uh, local authorities are concerned, but she will be aware that Glasgow City Council, for example, came out strongly in support of this duty as an enhancement of uh, any public authority that we decide to confer this responsibility on in their consideration of the place of the consumer as they take forward their policy making. Rhoda Grant. Again, though, I think clarity is required because while you're consulting on what that duty is and where it, how it works, I think those that have that duty placed on them need to know what it means for them here and now and indeed when the, the bill is going through Parliament. Um, a number of people spoke about um, product recall and um, Jackie Bailey, my colleague, talked about her Whirlpool Amendment. Oh, that's catchy. That's going to stick. Um, <clears throat> But they have to, Consumer Scotland has to have a role in a product recall and raising awareness because I think we're all aware of the whirlpool uh, situation where people are having difficulty getting information, people are having difficulty getting their machines changed and removed or even getting replacements or being compensated for that. And that's a huge fire risk, but also people are having to live without what is an essential piece of equipment, um, their washing machines, while they are maybe left with a washing machine they didn't use, um, they aren't able to replace it. So I think Consumer Scotland needs to do that, and Alexander Burnett talked about their role in coordinate, coordinating information, but I think they also have to have a stronger role in requiring um, companies to, to assist consumers when this happens. Lots of speakers also spoke about small businesses being consumers, and I think that is right. I think some thought has to be given, however, in the definition to make sure that when they are suppliers, they don't receive protection and that their consumers are, are not disadvantaged by that. But I think on the whole, that needs to be looked at. Richard Leonard talked about communities as consumers, and I think that's really important because a lot of people talked about broadband, about parcel surcharges, about universal services, and um, therefore they need to be able collectively uh, to exercise their consumers' rights, uh, as other groups um, that Andy Whiteman mentioned as well. And Claire Baker brought something new to the debate, talking about ticket touting, and I think, again, that would be really important that the, the organisation would have the powers to deal with this and take action because I think we've spoken about this on many occasions but actually nobody seems to be able to take action about that. 
Vulnerable customers need to be protected. And again, I agree with comments made by Jackie Bailey and Willie Coffey that it's not just people with characteristics, it's often people in different circumstances that can be preyed on because those circumstances are making them vulnerable. We need to be sure what the organization is. What, what does it do? A number of speakers taught, uh, talked about it being a campaigning organization, but is it a watchdog with teeth that can make real differences or is it simply a new pressure group that campaigns? Will it do both? Will it compel organizations um, to, that are not within the remit of this parliament, such as utility companies, to act? And I think that is incredibly important. Presiding officer, um, we support the bill at this stage. We want to see much more detail as we go forward through the other stages of the bill. If it brings something new to consumers, protects them better, then it'll be something that will be welcomed by the whole parliament. Uh, Jamie Halker Johnson, around eight minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I first uh, add my thanks to the committee clerking team for their work in relation to stage one report that we have uh, together produced? And also, can I thank the organisations and experts that have provided evidence to us as part of our scrutiny work? And it was extremely helpful and useful in our decision making. Um, our co uh, convener, uh, Gordon Linter, speaking for the committee, has outlined some of the detail of our stage one report. While in many ways this is a framework legislation for the new body, I strongly believe that there is a still a considerable body of work to be done before this Parliament can be confident that the Bill and Consumer Scotland will succeed in their objectives. The Committee has welcomed the principles of this legislation, and I believe all members will look to approach this Bill constructively and in a spirit of improvement. But this work has raised significant questions about the role, aims and operation of this new body questions that I feel are fundamental, and some have been covered uh, today. At this stage, there is still considerable lack of clarity of how Consumer Scotland will function. While I've read the Scottish Government's response to the Committee's Stage 1 report, I'm not sure I'm any clearer on several central points about its functions. The Scottish Government has been at pains to clarify its remit, but the broader issue of where it sits within the existing body of consumer organisations remains largely unanswered. The Scottish Government's response that much of this will be operational questions for the new organisation's board seems simply to kick some of these questions further down the road. We should, as the legislation is progressing, have at least some conception of the direction of the body and how it will avoid simply duplicating large amounts of existing work currently undertaken by other organisations. It is positive that ministers have accepted the committee's suggestion of a con Scottish Consumer Protection Partnership formalising some of these working relationships, including with trading standards in, in Scotland, which has the benefit of being a well-recognised and long-standing part of the consumer landscape. So too the position in relation to Citizens Advice Bureau has been raised several times. We all know from our constituents the value that is placed on consumer protection and the excellent work of these organisations on the public's behalf. In many cases, it is these organisations and advocates like us who are the only uh, buffers standing in the way of sharp practices and exploitations, particularly against vulnerable constituents. In my own region, for example, we've raised concerns over a number of out-and-out -out scams. But I've also campaigned on issues like delivery charges, which has been mentioned today, where people outside of the central belt can often be charged ent entirely disproportionate costs just to deliver to their home. In some cases, these charges are hidden below free delivery guarantees. This Parliament now has increased powers to act in these areas. The further powers were part of the Scotland Act 2016, implementing the recommendations of the Smith Commission, which every party in this chamber supported. So there is clearly space for the Scottish Government to act in terms of consumer adv advocacy and advice. And I'm sure that the view is, that view is shared across the political divides. As parliamentarians, we seek devolved consumer arrangements that are appropriate, that meet the expectations of the people who contact us or have issues referred. Ministers should look on the points raised today in that light. But as it stands, I don't feel we have enough information on the Scottish Government's proposals to be clear that uh, Consumer Scotland will be sure to make the real difference that ministers suggest. I've spoken about relationships with other organisations, and what's shone through the evidence is that there must be enduring and well-considered working links created between Consumer Scotland and other regulatory bodies. But again, we lack some of the details. To give one example on information sharing, 
the committee highlighted the provisions for data sharing provided in the relevant framework of the Enterprise Act 20, uh, sorry, uh, 2002. We proposed working with the UK government to ensure that Consumer Scotland could benefit from these arrangements. We now have assurance that this will be explored by the Scottish Government and conclusions will be shared. But it is surprising that faced with this bill, we're still only at the stage of explorations. A number of other colleagues have raised similar concerns, concerns that yet again I hope the Minister will be able to provide some answer to as the bill progresses. My colleague Dean Lockhart echoed issues around strengthening, not detracting from other bodies operating in this area. He also raised the issue of how consumer protections apply to small businesses, especially in remote and rural areas, drawing from the evidence of Shetland Islands Council. In many cases, these businesses in my region are often one or two people, and they find the transactions they take part in through their business have very different protections and access to, to support. And so I do welcome the Minister's earlier comments on this in his opening speech. The issue of duplication has already been uh, covered in some detail, so I won't rehash it. But I would again point to the concerns around Citizens Advice Scotland. Dean Locker also pointed out something uh, of the disconnect between this bill and the experience of the public when dealing with the Scottish Government and its agencies, where he asked whether similar protections for citizens receiving poor service from the public sector. Tom Mason raised the reporting requirements of the new body and its proposed annual consumer welfare report that will be laid before this Parliament. And again, it was interesting to get the clarification from the Minister on that. He also noticed the significance of the reviews of the organisation that are proposed in the bill. However, ministers should reflect on the length of this period going forward. That being said, these are positive steps, will help to ensure accountability and must be taken seriously, particularly in the early years of the Consumer Scotland's operation. Uh, a couple of other uh, interjections were, I think, a lot of very thoughtful contributions from fellow committee members which covered many of the kind of areas that we covered during the debate. Alexander Burnett as well, my colleague, praised Citizens Advice Scotland and welcomed their support for the small businesses uh, to be included or being considered in the bill. And Rhoda Grant just um, earlier raised concerns over the future funding of Citizens Advice Scotland. And this was something that came up a number of times and was an area of concern. And also around the, uh, the funding of local authorities and the particularly departments like trading standards, um, which again require to be properly funded so that they can actually uh, engage in some of the actions that the, uh, the new body may, campaigns that the new body may work on. Presiding officer, consumer rights provide protections recognizing that the normal process of law can resolve every, uh, cannot resolve, resolve every agreement made by the public in the average day. Not every purchase, nor every service provided should or will be brought to the courts when a dispute arises. So when consumers are mistreated, it's often to consumer advice protection and advocacy groups that they turn. These are issues that strike at the heart of fairness within our societies, as well as providing a level of justice to all. Consumer Scotland can make a difference to how consumers are uh, supported, but the Scottish Government's approach, while having merit, does not yet provide the clarity that will be necessary for such success. Thank you. Now call Jamie Hepburn to wind up the debate. Around 10 minutes will take us just before decision time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Can I begin by placing on record my thanks to uh, those members from across the chamber who have uh, taken the time to uh, contribute to today's debate. I think, by and large, uh, although there's been a few issues raised that may suggest the contrary, I think it's been a, a positive uh, debate. I think I detect a broad sense across the chamber that the direction of travel in establishing Consumer Scotland as a new organisation to uh, look out for the interests of consumers across uh, this country is uh, welcomed. Uh, that is something I, in my, uh, myself, uh, welcome. Clearly, there have been a number of uh, issues uh, raised that will be incumbent on me as the Minister taking forward this bill to engage with uh, members in relation to some of the concerns and some of the interests they've raised over the course of today's debate and at the outset, uh, President Officer, I commit uh, to uh, doing so. Uh, in relation to some of the issues uh, that have been raised over the uh, course of uh, this afternoon, a number of uh, members uh, were given to comment on the limited detail on the face of the bill about how Consumer Scotland will uh, operate when uh, established. My first observation it would be that it, this is uh, a high-level enabling bill in, in many ways, and I think that is 
uh, by and large, the right way to proceed. I hope we will all understand the core purpose and function of Consumer Scotland, uh, because, not least because it's laid out very clearly in section two of uh, the bill itself. Uh, I would observe that not ramming the face of the bill full of detail about how uh, Consumer Scotland will operate on a day-to-day -day basis is actually as much a strength as it could be perceived to be a weakness. I would imagine that most members in this chamber would uh, subscribe to our intention that this is a body that is wholly independent of uh, government and indeed independent of political direction. On that basis, I think it is uh, appropriate that we set up an organisation that is able to determine how it operates on a day-to-day -day basis uh, as much as is possible. That said, of course, I am and I have uh, committed, and I hope it's felt by the committee that my response to their uh, report was a positive one. I think I've taken on board all of their recommendations, recommendations, not least this one I'm committed to providing uh, more detail in relation to how uh, Consumer Scotland uh, will uh, operate. And uh, that may not require further amendment, but if it is felt that that uh, could be helpful, I will, of course, be willing to uh, uh, consider it such. Gordon Lindhurst, <coughs> in his uh, remarks, and let me again place on record my thanks to his committee for their uh, consideration. Gordon Lindhurst, uh, spoke of how a range of organisations came forward in the process of providing evidence, setting out uh, what they perceived the different priorities for Consumer Scotland would be. And indeed, we've heard a bit of that over the course of today, have we not, presiding officer, where people have brought forward a range of specific issues of consumer harm as uh, they have perceived it and as we've seen over uh, the recent uh, period. Again, I think that is itself a strength. It shows that there is no shortage of views and organisations that will want to engage with Consumer Scotland to make clear the issues they perceive that should be a priority for it to look at, and then it will be incumbent on Consumer Scotland to interact with them, to consult with them. And I would make the point again, they have to consult on their forward work programme that is laid out on the face of the bill. I believe we're st strengthening that provision, as the point I made to Ms Bailey, that not only should they be taking account of public sector organisations with a similar function, but also uh, organisations beyond the public sector to come up with a coherent uh, work uh, programme. That does take me into the area uh, of uh, some concern that's been raised around trying to ensure there's no duplication of effort. I agree with that as priority. Alec Cole Hamilton and others uh, made this point. That is why I've responded again positively to the suggestion uh, by the committee, as we discussed when I was giving evidence at the stage one process about the creation of a Scottish Consumer Protection Partnership so that all the relevant organisations can come together so that they are discussing the issues of the day and so that any duplication is minimised. I've committed for, to, for us to take that forward. That's something I've said we uh, will do. In relation to the position of uh, other bodies, um, Alec Cole Hampton, and I, th I hope I'm quoting him correctly, said that uh, the new body shouldn't cause other bodies to modify the good work they do or have the chilling effect so that bodies do not challenge a government. In respect of his latter part, let me say that if that is what we have been intending to do, my experience is that it has had very limited practical effect thus far. We do not, of course, seek to do that. It is appropriate that organisations robustly challenge government and indeed the intention by Consumer Scotland is that it will exercise such a function as well. That should, if anything, encourage other bodies to do uh, the same. Uh, a number of members talked about the concerns that were raised at stage one around the definition of consumer on, on the face of the bill uh, uh, as stands, excluding uh, the position of small businesses. I know the Federation of Small Business have uh, raised uh, that. They uh, set out that small businesses face the same hurdles uh, often as individual consumers do. I concede that we have recognised that we will bring forward uh, an uh, amendment. There are, of course, different ways to uh, achieve this. We could uh, set out a specific reference to small business, define it by size, as uh, Dean Lockhart mentioned. The Ombudsman Service, who I met uh, earlier this uh, week, have got uh, a definition. I would observe there is a slight difference in terms of functionality because, of course, they 
or a redress body where a specific small business or micro business would come forward seeking some form of redress. It's not quite the same here. And there is also an opportunity. I thought Richard Leonard made a very interesting observation that communities as a consumer could perhaps be included. So maybe there is an opportunity here in widening the definition of consumer to deal with both issues. I'll be very happy to uh, discuss that with him and I hope, I look forward to his full engagement and responding positively to my invitation uh, to meet to discuss that or, or any other issue. He said he wanted the bill to be transformed from being passive to active. I have to concede. I wasn't entirely sure what that meant. If he wants to meet me to further enlighten me, of course I'll be delighted to do that. But he did talk uh, around the uh, need for enforcement powers and respect for the demand for information by Consumer Scotland if an organisation for which such information is requested refuses to provide it. I was surprised that he wasn't aware that's actually on the face of the bill already between sections 8 uh, to 12. It's in the bill, it's in print, so I would urge him to have a look. But as I say, I'll be happy to meet to discuss. A number of members talked about product recall. recall. That is an issue we have debated recently, uh, an issue I was able to discuss with Electric Safety First uh, yesterday. Uh, the bill, of course, uh, and Jackie Bailey was talking about seeking to have the ability for uh, the for Consumer Scotland to take forward uh, such a, a, an activity. Uh, I would observe, actually, the bill already provides that ability. I think the issue here is the suggestion that there should be a duty. Uh, I am very open to considering that. I look forward to the Whirlpool Amendment, uh, as she has uh, called it, uh, when she seeks to bring it forward. I'm very open to considering it. I would say at this stage we will need to be careful that we don't create something that would create confusion uh, and have a consistency of messaging because there are of course other organisations that undertake some of this uh, activity and we also have to consider the context of what is devolved and what is reserved but yes I am uh, more than willing to look at, at that issue. Andy Whiteman uh, talked uh, about uh, the notion of the consumer in context of the well-being agenda an issue he raised at the committee similarly the the place of the consumer in a changing economy, a point also made by Richard Lyle. I actually believe our ambition is a shared one. I think the issues that he raises are pertinent, important, and I actually think they are part of the purpose of why we have brought forward this bill. I think what is in there in terms of the definition of consumer encompasses that. But of course, again, I am very happy to meet with him to discuss that, to see if we need to finesse the bill further. Uh, the definition of vulnerability was raised by a number of uh, members. We have never uh, sought to define narrowly uh, the uh, definition of vulnerability. I uh, appreciate that has been raised as concern and I am committed to addressing that issue. Jackie Bailey suggested the Scottish uh, Legal Service Complaints uh, guidance might be helpful in that regard. I'll be willing to look at this as an example. But the bottom line, let me assure every member, is that we are uh, committed, the fundamental position is that we are committed to uh, supporting amending the bill to take cognizance of the concerns. Let me close very briefly, uh, President Officer, talking about citizens' advice, uh, because I know that's been raised and I know that is an issue of uh, concern. Let me set out very clearly, uh, I greatly value the work of Citizens Advice Scotland and the Individual Citizens Advice Bureau. I think every single uh, member uh, does what we seek to take forward here will not encumber the ability of Citizens Advice Bureau to continue to undertake the work that they do uh, right uh, now. And I think in that regard, I should say to Rhoda Grant, the funding that we have historically provided them and continued up to this financial year has not been about the provision of frontline advice in relation to consumers. That's not been something we have funded, but we will continue uh, to work with them. I engage with uh, Citizens Advice Scotland regularly in meeting their chair and chief executive uh, next week and I will always continue uh, to do so in respect of the important role they play in supporting consumers and citizens in uh, Scotland. There is of course much more I could say about this uh, bill. Uh, President Officer, time prohibits me from being able to say too much more today but I hope uh, that Parliament will unite this evening to agree the general principles of the bill and I'll be very glad to come back to say a lot more about the Consumer Scotland Bill in due course.
Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes our Stage 1 debate on the Consumer Scotland Bill. The next item is consideration of motion 20319 in the name of uh, Derek Mackay, Cabinet Secretary, uh, on the financial resolution for the Consumer Scotland Bill. Could I call on the Cabinet Secretary to move this motion? Thank you. We turn now to decision time. The first question is that motion 20544 in the name of Jamie Hepburn on stage one of the Consumer Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you. And the final question is that motion 20319 in the name of Derek Mackay on a financial resolution for the Consumer Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you very much. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting. <laughs>